Hello, good evening, welcome along. Uh, thank you to the audience uh, for joining as the invited guests. And also, if you're watching online, um, it's great to have you watching. That's fantastic. Now, I'm Johnny Minkley. I'm a games critic and broadcaster. And uh, if you were watching uh, the live stream, what you may not appreciate is what's happened here in the last half an hour where the grand stage for Sony's press conference has been transformed uh, very rapidly by a team of fantastic workmen with cranes and all sorts who have constructed this uh, rather cozy little venue for our panel discussion tonight. And the purpose of that, um, off the back of um, all of the things that shown, Sony has uh, shown us this evening, is to talk about games as art. And that's not our games art. I think we've all been there, we've done that, we've had that conversation, and we've moved on. And we'll be talking about um, just the, the artistic vision, the creative possibilities of video games. Uh, and on that note, we have a lovely display behind us uh, in, the, in the background here. Now, what that is, is we, we started all this off with a competition for um, um, PlayStation community members that was uh, kicked off by the blog. And we asked people to send in their own artwork that they created that's inspired by their video game experiences. And the ones that you're seeing along the back now, we have tons of fantastic entries. And these are the ones that we've mounted them, we've, uh, but they're all original artworks produced by guys, and they were selected by um, my fabulous panel alongside me who will be uh, talking about art in games. So I think that's a good time for, I think I'll let them introduce themselves. So we'll go along the line, and if I can ask you each to um, introduce yourself first, give a little overview of what you do, and then also explain what it is, because you've all got quite interesting and different backgrounds, what it is about the um, artistic possibilities of interactive entertainment um, that excites you. So, Mr. Yoshida, if you'd like to begin. Yes, um, I'm Shu Yoshida. I'm the president of Worldwide Studios for Sony Computer Entertainment. I oversee the first party uh, uh, type of development for PlayStation Group. Um, well, talking about art, um, I'm not artist, but I really appreciate you know, looking at good art, and there are lots of uh, creative you know, people working in the studios. Uh, um, and there are also people learning, uh, you know, wanting to, you know, get into the video game industry. So uh, it, it's wonderful experience to uh, interact with these people and see how, you know, uh, they create uh, very uh, artistic uh, products. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm Alex Evans, uh, sort of co-founder in Performing Monkey at Media Molecule, and. Um, I sort of got into to games almost by accident. I thought I wanted to be an artist, but I can't draw to save my life. So I taught myself to program, and then as a bet, applied to Bullfrog as an intern. And for me, what I discovered was this accidental journey into games that I was kind of, you know, playing around. I wasn't really serious about it. And then I discovered that the journey of making games, the actual process of making games, completely captivates me. And 20 years later, I'm still making games in pretty much the same way as I did 20 years ago. I just love working with people to make these things, and the art is kind of a, a byproduct of that journey. So that's, that's my take. Ian. Hi, I'm Ian Dallas. I'm the creator director at Giant Sparrow, and we're working on a game called The Unfinished Swan. And the thing that really drew me to games was the opportunity to surprise people and to create uh, experiences that people had never had before. So kind of in line with uh, you know, the whole Surrealist project, uh, like Dolly and Bunuel and, and people that created work, even Henson, that, that create places that you know, people had never thought of and that in video games I, I really am drawn to the idea that you could put people into those worlds and let them poke around and explore and continue to surprise them. Thank you. Kelly. I'm Kelly Santiago, a former president and co-founder of That Game Company, where I worked on Flow, Flower, and Journey. I'm also a partner uh, in an angel investment fund called Indie Fund, where we develop, uh, fund projects by new independent developers to help them get and stay financially independent. And I had always been attracted to the arts. Um, I went, I came from music and then into theater, and I was uh, working in theater in New York when I decided to pursue a master's degree in this thing called interactive media. And it, I had played games all my life, but hadn't really thought about making them until I was exposed to it there. And both the process of making them and also the people who make them just immediately attracted me. And I knew that's what I kind of wanted to do all along. Thank you. And uh, next on the line, please. Um, my name is Adam Volker. I'm the creative director at a new interactive branch of a small startup animation studio in Louisiana. Um, I got interested in video games, well, I grew up playing them, but I think that every art form has a unique uh, piece of it that makes that art form unique, and for games it's interactivity. And a true master would be somebody who really can take that and make people get emotional responses out of different kinds of interactivity. 
and I'm intrigued by the possibilities of that. And last but not least. Hi, my name's Gavin Moore. I'm the well, game director and art director on Puppeteer, which is an internal title from our Tokyo-based Japan studios. Um, I'm pretty much like Alex. I got into the games 20 years ago in Mindscape, doing pixel art, which I love, and still kind of tinkering around in that. And it's that pureness of games and that pureness of the art which uh, really strives to uh, drive me on with the passion I have to make the quality that we have to go forward in. Great. Now, just to give you uh, guys an idea how this is going to work, we're going to have a, a bit of a discussion to start things off then. For the final 20 minutes or so, we'll be taking questions from the audience, but we'll also be taking questions from you guys watching on the stream as well if you've got a question from Twitter, because I'm tableted up here and I'll be keeping my eye on that later on. So if you do have a question for the panel you want to ask, please tag it PS. GC, and we'll try and pick a few of those out later on. Um, but in the meantime, I don't want to probably labour too much on definitions of art, but I wonder, can we consider, do we consider that all video games are art, or is there something about certain video games that makes them stand out uh, as, a, as a work of art in, in some sort of uh, sense? Um, let's start with Kelly. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think video games are a medium through which art can be potentially created. So not all games are necessarily artistic, um, but it is a medium through which artistic works can be done. That's okay. how I would define it. <laughs> Good definition. Uh, Ian. Uh, yeah, so for me, I, I was thinking about it, and I think I broadly agree with Kelly that uh, you know, they're certainly an art form. Uh, but I think when we talk about games as art, often what we really mean are, are games that are, are personal and that you know, evoke an emotional response that is kind of unusual and surprising. And I think that in that case, there are a lot of games that are really not very personal. Uh, that you know, and progressively, it seems like you know, over the years, uh, games have become less and less personal, partly because they've become works of larger and larger teams. And you know, it's something that is personally very interesting as a 12-person company trying to hold on to that. It's already difficult. Like when you're one person, it's much more easy to make something that is a personal expression of what you're doing. But even you know, with a small team like 12 it becomes more and more difficult to hold on to that. Mm. Um, I mean, Adam, you've done lots of, I mean, some really interesting sort of uh, applications, but now you're, you know, you're sort of moving on to, to console. What, what's your view of the sort of artistic credentials of uh, um, video games? I think there's a lot of uh, uh, untapped potential in games still. Um, and I think that um, an art form is, is about communication, communication to the viewer, player, reader, whatever. And um, there's a lot of games out there that are communicating a consistent message really well. But I think there's a lot more messages to be communicated, and whether it's, it's big team, small team, or whatever, I think that um, I think that games are art. Uh, I just think um, that there's a lot left to do. Sure. Now, um, Gavin, you are an art director, of course. Is, mm. is everything you make art? Um, I'm going to disagree with everything that everybody's just said. I don't believe that games are art at all. In fact, I believe that games are craft, and it's a craft that you learn, and it's a skill that you learn, and you have to put a tremendous amount of hard work and day after day grind into it to produce the gorgeously beautiful things that you see on the stage that we saw today. Um, and maybe it's because I'm an old war horse and I don't really like to get into this whole discussion anyway, so I was kind of surprised <laughs> that they actually put me up here in the first place. But um, to me, it's especially after I spent the last 10 years in Japan, they have a thing called kodawari. And Kodawari is basically where somebody spends basically the whole of their life perfecting a skill. And they achieve national status, some of these people. But they're not called artists, they're called craftsmen. So you can make a shochu cup, talking about alcohol, of course, being an Englishman. But you can make a shochu cup and you can put it on your table and you can look at it and you can really appreciate it. But it's about how it feels in your hand, which to me with games is exactly the same. And then you feel that game in your hand and you get a personal experience from it. But if you ever went to one of these guys in Japan and says, is it art? He'd cut your head off, basically. It, it's not. It's about spending and retaining and p refining things, giving somebody an emotion, but it has a use. And that's really important to me in games. That's a really interesting perspective. So, uh, Mr. Shida, as the, as the, as the Japanese uh, gentleman on the panel, do, do, you, do you understand the difference he's drawing between an artist and a, and a craftsman? Um, no, I don't. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sacked. <laughs> the question to Gavin, actually, is, you know, so, so why are you calling yourself the art director? 
I don't call myself my art director. It's Human Resources call me art director. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, under, under the company rule, rules, say that I'm an art director. Yeah. So we should start calling you Craftsman? Yes, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> director of Craft. We, 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 can, we can have a word with your HR department. Um, so, so Shuri, then, do you think all games are art, or do you think there is something that makes them? Well, I, I them? think uh, what Ke, you know, Kelly said, like uh, there's a potential. You know, when you you know think about when uh, a painting becomes an art, you know, not all painting would be art, I guess. Okay. So, you know, thinking about when game when games become an art, I, I think uh, there's a uh, you know amount of creativity you know put into the product uh, can be uh, one way to uh, look at. The other is, uh, you know, the uh, people tend to call, you know, smaller games more artistic games, like uh, games like, uh, you know, Unfinished Swan, you know, are very artistic, and Johnny, of course, you know, the people, uh, games, you know, created by a small number of people tend to carry the vision of the, you know, creator through you know, uh, to the product. You know, some you know game director like uh, Weda san you know, is very meticulous about you know uh, m making sure that everything that's put into the game. Uh, yeah, he, he is, seems uh, to be spending his whole life making one game. Uh, well, <laughs> two or three. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but, but uh, I, I really you know admire those type of you know creative process, and I, I understand it's really hard you know because you know there are lots of you know people with a creative mind. In trying to create one product, and especially trying to you know support the vision of the you know game director or creative director or craftsman, uh, so I really appreciate the effort you know that goes into creating uh, these games. I mean, Alex, you, you, you're best known for a game that is about art and craft. So, so where do you sit on this? Yeah, my my head's spinning a bit trying to take in everyone's point of view because I think they're valid, and I think of myself as a craftsman as well, but. In the end, your craft is for an end. I think I was very inspired, actually, by Criterion over the road from our studio, who, who uh, someone described it to me that they make these beautiful pop culture. You know, they're a perfect Coke can of, of lovely consoleness. And when we when we started our studio to work on PlayStation, I wanted a personal message. I we had a vision of explaining to everyone how games are made, like the Lego of games. That's what we wanted to make before we even knew what Little Big Planet was. But at the same time, I was looking at these amazing products that reached these huge audiences, and I wouldn't call them art in the sense of the personal, you know, the unfinished one, the journey, the, the small team kind of vision. But on the other hand, I loved the fact that they were this thing that reached people and touched people in different ways. And the more we can demystify the way make games are made, mm. the more people will connect with them. Because everyone believes they know how films are made, whether they're right or wrong. You know, they think, yeah, you get a camera, you get some people and you film it, and then it's done. And that's not actually right, but they think they understand the process. And I love the fact that there's this trend towards a kind of indie thing where people believe, yeah, I understand how one, two, five people could put a game out and I can see the pieces. And that, for me, is exciting and changes what games are. I don't know if it's art or not, but it, it's... It changes what games are in the eyes of the, the audience who are consuming it. So. Now, Shuri, I wanted to bring you back in here because, I mean, we've just watched the press conference. We saw a lot of, you know, you made a lot of announcements. You showed a lot of, I think, that, I mean, just following it on Twitter at the same time as well, there was lots of good response, I think, just to how much new content there was in there as well. And lots of, you know, interesting artistic projects. And, and Sony in particular, I mean, I visited Sony Santa Monica uh, a few months ago and, and so much, um, you know, including, you know, some of the guys on the table as well, so much um, original content has come out of that. But... For a company, a platform holder, a publisher, a lot of that is really commercially risky. There's no guarantee that funding any of this stuff is going to earn you any money at the end of the day. So why do you do it? Why, why do we do it? Mm. Yeah, because we love to do it. Mm -hmm. And the, actually, these uh, groundbreaking game like Little Big Planet, you know, really uh, works financially as well in the end. You know, when something really imaginative and uh, new is uh, uh, realized. So you know, we. We, we are a big fan of, you know, continuing to uh, uh, bet on these uh, uh, creative people uh, working, you know, on new ideas. Because, mm. I, mean, I mean, Kelly, could you imagine uh, another sort of supersized publisher of, of, of supporting you in the way that that, that, that game company was, was nurtured? Um, n certainly in, not in the way. I mean, I, I, I think... What difference did it make to, to what you were doing? Uh, it made all the difference. It made it possible. Um, I think uh, she hey, had a great way of putting it, which is, you know, why do you why why do we do it, and why did we uh, we as developers and the people we connected with um, within the Sony family, you know, why did they support us? 
there's there's no other reason than just be, because because you you love it because you feel like it's the right thing to do and this game needs to be made um, and that that answer is something that's really hard for a publicly traded company to <laughs> to justify their decisions with and it, and it takes a lot of um, of faith uh, and and I think we were very, very fortunate mm. to to work with such people they're hard to find and I mean Ian and unfinished ones a pretty pretty out there idea were you, were you were you I mean pleasantly surprised but were you, were you surprised when 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 sort of Sony Sony really went for it in a big way uh, yeah no I, I was surprised initially the project was you know one and a half years with five people and I was a little surprised then and then when the project grew to three years and 20 or like 15 people or so including outsourcing I was even more surprised, and I think you know, with that game company, uh, Giant Sparrow also has an incubation deal, which I think we're the, the only two so far, which is kind of a bizarre thing for a company to do, to say that like, we believe in you so much that we're gonna like, carve out a space in our office and you know, give you not only like, a place to live, but also you know, like, development kits, and you know, we'll throw in programmers who will come by every week and talk to you. I mean, really it's saying, you're not competent probably to make a game, but we like you enough that we're going to do what we can to make it happen. Right, it's a bet on people, isn't it? It seems, I don't know your experience, yeah. but it's, it seems like Sony are really good at having faith to bet on a particular team, like a particular set of people they kind of get on with. Is that, is that your experience? Yeah, and it's interesting that, you know, with us, it's, it's not at all like the developer-publisher relationships that I've heard about, where publishers will say, you're like, oh, this contract that we signed two years ago when the game was completely different said you were going to have two vehicles in your game. Why do you only have one vehicle? Like, you need to have two, because that's what it says here. And, you know, I think a lot of it just comes at Sony from the top down, that, you know, because Shuei is obviously personally committed to it, you know, so much that he will sit on a panel and talk about it, <laughs> that everyone else feels like it's okay to get personally involved too. And we had people, you know, just uh, throughout the whole project going way beyond what seemed like I would have expected for people to do. Like, we had a level designer who uh, was moving from New York and didn't have a place to stay. And one of the Sony producers said, Oh, my parents will host him. <laughs> and so he just stayed there for a couple weeks. <laughs> and, and I think that's, I mean, it's not always that explicit, but Sony has been incredibly uh, supportive in ways that, you know, go way beyond what, you know, is in the terms of a contract. Because I think everyone at Sony that we work with, at least, really are interested in making these kind of games. And, uh, well, I mean, I bring you at this, at this point, Adam. I mean, why, why partner with Sony? There's obviously lots of companies you, you could work with. Um, and how did you become aware of um, Wonderbook? Uh, well, Sony approached us um, after they'd seen Morris. And, um, and we felt like it was a good venue to tell stories on. Um, and they've been incredibly supportive. But I think that your earlier question is, why do you do it, um, is to me proof that it's an art form. And it's because you can't do anything else. It's because you go to sleep and you have nightmares about the project you're working on because you want it to be as best as it can be and you miss the email, you forgot to send the thing or the, I mean, it just, that to me is sort of gratifying that like this is worth my time and this is worth, this medium is worth the rest of my life's exploration hmm. because there's so much left to do and it's just, it takes so much of me to do, I don't know. But yeah, so I mean, hmm. Sony's been great about um, understanding what, it's important to Moonbot about what we want to do, or what we hope we can do in games, and um, and just we've been al we've been aligning really on that for Wonder Book. And um, Alex, you know, as, as part of Sony, um, clearly there must be commercial pressures at at some level. And you know, you've announced a new project, today. and I have to say, hats off. I mean, I don't mean this in the nicest possible way. But it's great that Sony's managed to keep some stuff secret that hasn't leaked yeah. in advance. It's, it's always been, it's always it's nice been to be amazing surprised. to to get it out there. But I mean, I'm sure I really grind the gears of the producers at Sony sometimes, and and vice versa. But in a, in a way, if you have that kind of honest relationship where it's like, you are really winding me up right now because you have a different agenda from me, and then you work through it and you're like, actually, you have exactly the same agenda. And I think for me, it comes back to once, you've, once you meet people within Sony or a publisher or whatever where they're willing to say, I put my neck on the line for you, and if you, if you really believe in what you believe in, and I disagree with you, but I will go on sticking my neck out. So, so we had hard times on Little Big Planet and you know, commercial pressures and everything else, and they're real. And the, I understand them. And I love the fact that people at Sony were willing to kind of, um, excuse my language, but a bit of a, a shield, an, an SH something something shield for us. <laughs> and 
It was great. They, it really felt like we had allies, even though they weren't necessarily agreeing with us all the time. And that is the sign of a good friend, right? So, so Sony were very supportive in that way, and and, and continue to be. And um, I love that they take these risks on on at different scales or different people. You know, we were a completely unknown startup, and yeah, it's amazing. And I want to move on to a more broader discussion of, of, of technology in a second. But just on the point, I think people will be surprised that you chose Vita as a platform for your for your next big game. So, so why was that? Oh, well, I mean, Vita's an amazing, it is one, the best handheld platform. And when we founded Media Molecule, we wanted to do a single platform game. Because as a small studio, we didn't want to worry about cross-platform stuff. And we were like, hey, there's a new platform around. Let's just have fun with this. And Rex and his team also gave a chance for them to grow. It's like, guys, look at this as, a, as an opportunity. There's this crazy box with back touch and just other buttons and things, that, gyros, and go crazy. And a lot of the features in the game eventually came out of a game jam. I, I know I'm similar experience to we kind of pseudo indie. We're like learning from these guys because we lost focus and, and we were like, wow, this game's huge. And then we thought, well, let's go back to the Vita. And by worrying about the platform, we were able to focus. So Vita has helped us shape the game that Tearaway is. It's, 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 it's a Vita game and, and it's, it's allowed a small team to not kind of lose their way and go off and just smoke, you know, some, I don't know, we, we were focused. <laughs> what do you smoke at Media Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm, yeah, I don't know, I wanted to open it up to you guys. Like, how do you keep focused on a three-year project? Because making games is this kind of epic mission, and, and you were saying you, you, you sleep it, you, you live it, and, yeah. and it's so easy to lose sight of why you start at the beginning. And having people like Shu coming in saying, I love this game, it's great, let's show it at Gamescom. We were like, wow, this is amazing, what support and what instant judgment. What, well, you know, to bring Gavin in, give us a sense of how that works in, in the Japan studio. In the Japan studio, yeah. in the Japan studio, I mean, it's very Japanese. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's basically the same. We're all creators, whatever nationality we are, and we all live this, breathe it. We've all been doing it for a long time, and we all love it. And, you know, I understand what Alex is saying. You do lose focus, and you do lose your way, and there are many paths to get to the same point which is very true, especially if you're living in Japan. You know, it's very wabi-sabi and you can go around things and move around things and get there. But at the end of the day, it's your personal drive that keeps you going. One thing I'll say about Sony, I've been working there for, I think it's 15 years. It, it, it feels very, very long time, it is a very long time, and I still love it. And the reason I love it is where it came from originally, back when it was released in 1994. Most of the producers who made those games back then came from the music industry. From Sony Music. And that's why they have this ethic and quality inside the studio to allow people like these to go away and be creative. You know, don't F with the artist, basically. Um, you're going to be given time, you're going to be given the money you need as long as you pull out something special. And that's the way it's always been, and that still exists. And it still exists in the Japan studio today for me. And that's why I stay there and work there. So on the point of advanced in technology, if you look at the history of um, video games as a creative form, it's, it's, it's defined at the various levels, but you, know, you, can, you can look at it in the generations of console hardware, it's def the, the defined by the limitations of the, of the technology, but you know, we're seeing such an amazing variety of stuff now. I saw an interview quite recently, there were comments, I think it was the head of 2K Games, where he was talking about photorealism in video games and talking about how you know, when we achieve that in video games, that's really going to drive innovation, which I thought was a, personally thought was quite an odd way of thinking about it. So just, just with that in mind, I'd be interested in what the panel thinks about um, where we are right now with technology and gaming, how, in terms of the type of games that you want to create, how limiting is it, and what, um, with what you think is going to happen with future technology, what will that um, enable you to do that you can't do now? Um, and I'll bring you in at the end on this in the technology question, Shui, but um, if we start with, uh, actually, uh, Adam. With me? Uh, no, no, with, uh, yes. You, 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 you. I, think, um, I think we've been in a graphics race for a really long time, and I'm bored of that, actually. Um, I think that games like Journey have been incredibly successful visually. Um, but I think, like, the, as far as technology goes, um, interface is like um, a place to pioneer. And with things like the Vita or the Wonder Book, like doing, you don't have a controller anymore. Maybe it's your body, or maybe it's a like something that has move sensitivity or maybe it's got touch pads or whatever. But I think that's really, like, that gets back to the core of what games are good at is interaction. And if you're giving new ways to do that, then there's new possibilities and new ground to break that way. I mean, the graphic stuff, like, better rendering and photoreal stuff's always gonna 
Like computers are always going to get faster and faster and faster, and that's just inevitably going to happen. But I think the creative part is more in like how you interact with what you make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Um, such a big question. I th it's a really exciting time right now and continues to get more and more exciting because I think there's a lot of uh, movement on all fronts. I guess for me, the last year has been all about the, the middlewares and the explosion of tools like Unity and um, Crytek talking about their, you know, the, the new aspects of their engine here. And it's just, uh, it seems to be really living up to the potential that middleware has always hoped to, which is to unlock the possibility for many more types of people with different backgrounds and not just strict um, years of computer science backgrounds and allowing different, different voices into games. And that's just personally super, super exciting to me as a game maker, but especially as a gamer. I, I feel like more and more the, the new games that I'm interested in usually have some middleware logo at the beginning of it these days. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's why, because mm -hmm. it allowed this person to make a game who previously never would have been able to enter into the world of video game development. And yeah, in fact, actually, I was, I was at a student competition at the weekend in Scotland, uh, just where, where teams and, you know, they'd all been using diff you know, things like Unity and the things they've been able to create in just a nine week period is, is absolutely amazing now. And there's so many ways of doing this online. And, um, just speaking to those students now, just saying that it's so much easier now for people, as you say, that without, without any sort of coding skill or whatever, to, if they have an idea, they can put it into place. Yeah, yeah, and whether or not it can be, you know, you can use those tools to make the, the best, most polished games, I think it just the fact that it allows for an entry point for a new type of developer, for someone new into the medium to, mm -hmm. to yeah, make something, distribute it, get feedback from players, and like start getting on that energetic flow that you do, and which will encourage them to then learn more tools and build mm -hmm. out their skill set. Um, Ian, on the, on the current limits of technology and what might come in the future, where do you sit with the, the type of games you want to make? Uh, so I, I think one of the interesting things about working on the PlayStation is that the experience that players have with it has been so changed by the technology around it. Even though the PlayStation hasn't actually changed you know, it, itself in the last six years or so, uh, you know, with the rise of tablets and all kinds of other places for people like Facebook and people to, to play games, the kinds of games that they come to PlayStation for has, has changed pretty dramatically. So for better or worse, you know, a lot of the much more casual, sort of um, you know, short kind of throwaway games have migrated to other platforms. And so you know, PlayStation has become the home for something that has a lot more, de like games that have a lot more depth to them and meat and things that people you know, will spend five years like really polishing and tuning. And you know, other platforms have, have become something you know, a little smaller, and so, yeah, it's, in, in the broader context, it's interesting that it's become sort of like, uh, like the PlayStation is like for features, and everything else, it feels like is sort of more YouTube-based, in a way, uh, and as a creator, I think it really excites me that I get to be lazier and not solve a lot of problems, that with every, you know, new generation, there are things that uh, you, you suddenly, you can do the things that you used to do that would have taken you a year, and now you can do them, you know, quickly in, in an hour, and a designer can do it, and you don't have to get, you know, a lot of people involved. So, like, you know, our game looks incredibly simple, and it is for the most part, uh, but there are things like getting shadows to work properly required that we talk to a technical artist, like, we, we couldn't get the shadows to work because they were too pixelated. So we had to go to a technical artist at God of War and talk to him about it, and he's like, oh, well, there's this plugin for Maya. And Great, and then the plugin for Maya doesn't work uh, because you know it only bakes 32 meg textures. And we need like 100 meg textures to reduce them down, and just getting the shadows to work took us probably like four months. And I'm so excited that you know as the platforms get more powerful, we don't have to solve those problems. We can be lazier about them and just have like a much less optimal solution because people ultimately don't like players don't care about that. They just want things that look you know good enough to get by. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about the potential to be lazier. Uh, about that, yeah. <laughs> can can you be a lazy gamer, a lazy developer now, Alex? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, this is a really hot topic for me, but personally, because I'm the graphics coder. You know, I, I, that is my job when I'm not waving my hands around. And and here's the thing: technology, I adore. Siggraph, I just absorb all the papers, and I and. But it's the palette. So the reason a lot of games go back to pixel art and stuff is because you it allows you to not. Uh, pick your battles there. You can go in and like do pixel art. And these days, it's it's like 
easy to toss around 5,000 sprites and now you can like innovate in that space. So what's amazing about new tech for me isn't photorealism. I actually don't think that's a valid goal for driving things forward. I think it's an amazing thing to be able to do, but I don't think it's going to drive games forward. But what will be amazing is this super mega high tech physically based rendering stuff that's pouring out of the research. That will give us a new palette, which means that then yeah. creative people are like, wow, now I don't have to worry about shadows and pixelation and stuff, and I can do physically based rendering in order to produce a game that completely looks how I have it in my head, which might not be realistic. And okay. wow, I just love technology for that reason, to hide the pain that the developers have to go through. <laughs> so, yeah. I see you nodding vigorously with what Alex oh, is saying, Gary. I completely, completely, utterly agree. I mean, Alex and I have been doing it for 20 years, and when you start off right at the bottom, you've got this machine that's got eight colors, you know, and you're going, wow, that's great, and then I, I want 16 <laughs> colors, and you're on to the next machine, well, yes. and you keep pushing it, you keep pushing it, you keep pushing it. And especially with Puppeteer, it was in my head, visually, it was not the photorealistic stuff that I've been doing in the past. I wanted to get away from it. I wanted to get away from the limitation of, of the photorealism. You know, you're going to hit that graphics chip. You're going to hit that ceiling somewhere, and it's going to hurt you. And your programmer's going to turn around and stab you in the back, because you're <laughs> telling them to render 150 million lights. So, you know, the whole thing that in my head was, I, I just wanted to leave that behind. You know, I didn't care about the numbers of wrinkles on faces anymore or the reflections in the eyes. You know, I know people in Japan who work for a certain very famous RPG company, and all they do is put reflections in eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mean, I go insane. Right. <laughs> so, m in my feeling for what I was making, it was much more exactly what Alex said. There were going to be technologies that were going to allow me to create something that I wanted to make that was in my head. Mm -hmm. And that was really special to me you know, that we could shift that away from the technology. I mean, what's really interesting, I love the fact that you guys are using middleware and you're using as much technology as you can get your hands on to do everything. We don't use any. And we don't use any because I'd rather throw it at my godlike rendering programmer who goes and writes 3D in a week for me, you know. And I have complete control over it. I'm not limited. You're still limited for me when you're using middleware besides a provider. But it's awesome that people on small teams can use that technology and make these wonderful things, definitely. Now, uh, Mr. Shida, then, this, this you know, fascinating discussion. How, how does this discussion inform um, how Sony approaches what it may do in the future with uh, hardware? Well, Actually, I got the last quest, uh, same question in last year's panel here. You know. <laughs> You've had a year to think about the, uh, the answer. Well, yeah, the, the theme was, you know, uh, games in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I said uh, last year, uh, what do I want to see in 10 years in games uh, was uh, a perfect human being, you know, created in digital form. And when I said, you know, other panelists, you know, like uh, Terry, but, well, it, well, it will never happen. And so that, what, what that means is, uh, you know, games industry, we have a lot, you know, to produce uh, in the, you know, coming 10 or 20 years. You know, there'll be, you know, uh, lots of new uh, techs uh, created and, uh, you know, game as media is like a, a spongy to suck in every single computer uh, technology advancement, like network or graphics, uh, you know. Uh, so all these, you know, so the recent games like cinematics games like Last of Us or the Beyond, um, uh, talking about you know uh, uh, performance capture, um, mm -hmm. you know, to recreate those you know great actors uh, that exist. But you know, going beyond the capture, you know, how you know you know you can recreate the. Uh, a digital character that thinks and behaves like uh, So I'm excited 10 years after the 10 years when the perfect human is easy and so we can just do that like like a pixel art game now you're just like yeah we'll do that but then we'll we'll do the sword and sorcery on it and 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 just bend it a little bit so I, I, I'm excited by your 10 years and then not then 10 years beyond that's that's <laughs> right, I'm going to throw it open now to, to you guys in the audience and to the, you watching on the live stream. I'm going to have a flick through this in a second, but in the meantime, anyone uh, in the room, if you have a question, would you like to raise your hand? There is a question over there. If you could wait, there is someone with a roving microphone. Is that... Uh, do we have... A, oh, there we go. If you could say uh, who you are, where you're from, and uh, give you a question. Hello, I'm <coughs> James Dominguez from Fairfax Digital in Australia. Um, I was at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam a couple of days ago and I saw an exhibit that 
uh, I walked through looking at all these beautiful artworks and on one floor there was an exhibit of applied art. It was talking about prints and how artists essentially sold their talents to make posters and the covers of books and things like that. But they in turn became art, got framed, got put on, got put on walls. Do, do you think there's a, uh, in looking at games and art and how they fit together, do you think there's a, looking at that as a, a the differentiation between fine art and applied art is a, is a valid sort of dichotomy? Is, there, is that a valid way of looking at games, do you think? Uh, good question. Uh, who, who feels like tackling that? Um, I think that's a different convention, you know, like entirely. The, the idea of, of uh, you know, selling out in art is so old, you know, like um, Van Gogh versus, I don't know, somebody making prints or illustration. And if, and are you asking then, is it, is it like, uh, is there a metaphor between indies versus large studios or something? <laughs> I'm thinking more along the lines of what we've been doing until this point is making a, is mostly making applied art. Do you think oh. we now have the freedom to make fine art, which is what I think that game company and several other developers have been doing? Um, Tough question. Uh, that's a complicated to answer. I would well, say he, no. Yes? I would say no. <laughs> I'd say we're still making applied art. We still haven't got there. Even though you can get amazing emotional responses, um, but some people are. I'm going to disagree. Yeah, some people are. I, w I was I was going to lean that way actually. Okay. When do you think? When do you think we will, Gavin? <laughs> if we're not now, when do you think we might? I think we will um, exactly when we start um, growing up a little bit more, and you know we stop chasing that technology bubble to a certain extent, and we start thinking more along the lines of the emotions of our users. And what we want to say physically as human beings out there, if you look at a lot of filmmakers, for instance, and a lot of them wouldn't say they're even artists at all, but they're trying to make personal statements or political statements or religious statements. And we're not really doing that yet. And until we start doing that and reaching out to our users and making them feel that this is something that, that really touches them deep down and actually says, hey, come on, that, that really... Maybe. I, I guess I feel like art by definition is anything you can get something out of. So if this glass moved me, then it's art, you know, it could be artistic. In that way, there's been a lot of games that I've played in my lifetime that have moved me, and those are uh, those I consider art. So, um, as a medium, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but I think that it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, Kelly, I'd like to hear your thoughts because, in terms of, you know, obviously that's what you're trying to do is create different emotional responses with the games you've made previously than what you've done before. Um, Gavin says games need need to grow up. Would you agree? Um. <laughs> I think um, what's important about, to me, the conversation of, of games are art is that, is that we recognize that games make us feel things in general. And as players, we can talk about how we respond to games. But especially as game makers, we're having conversations about how what we do in our games is affecting our players and, and talking about it and taking responsibility for it and evolving through that process and, and trying out new things in games and seeing if they work with our players and then, and then uh, evolving, uh, iterating over, the, uh, over our projects. Um, I think that to me is what I see a lot in games that are leaning on older technologies, but expressing different subjects. Um, because to me, they reveal the fact that there was um, nothing necessarily from an idea standpoint 20 years ago stopping people from making games that were more, pro more provocative or, or more um, uh, expressive um, or less so or whatever. Um, it's just that I think the conversation wasn't happening. Okay, now I, I have a question from Twitter from uh, user Chris John, so thank you for sending your question in. The question is, um, how do you view user-generated content in games in relation to art? Uh, I suppose, Alex, you'd be the obvious person to uh, <laughs> yeah. shove that one towards. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm lost, so I opened it up. I mean, I was trying to work out this art games thing, because I don't commonly ask myself a film art, and maybe in a way they're not their craft, but they're, they're films of film, and I love the idea that games are games, but I, wanna exp I love the idea that games are growing up, taking responsibility, these themes are really interesting, and it's to do with the context that you consume it in and the context that you make it in. So like, 
the original question, um, the previous question was, you know, maybe the applied arts are, are, are consumed in a different context than the fine arts. And I think there are games to be consumed with your friends on the sofa and there are games to be consumed, you know, on your own as a private moment between you and the game creator. And those will be more fine art-ish, but I don't need them to be fine art. I just need them to be personal game experiences. And so when UGC comes into it, it becomes more personal because it's, you know that it's a guy or a girl on the other end of this tool that you probably know how it works. And so by definition, user-generated content is in the context of a personal experience. And so I like the fact that UGC gives you that connection. But it's not necessarily fine art, but it, it's in that one-to-one, -one, wow, this person was trying to say this thing to me or do this mm -hmm. thing. And uh, Ian, actually, to bring you in, if, if you're not familiar with um, The Unfinished Swan, it's a, it's a first-person painting game in a, mm -hmm. in a white world, I think. That's the, that's the tagline mm -hmm. for the game. And mm -hmm. players, you know, they can use a controller or the PlayStation Move to, to spray paint anywhere. Do you, in the way you look at it, then, can someone in, within your game create, create their own art with just the way that they're sort of using it as a blank canvas. Yeah, and that's something that you know, was there from the very beginning, uh, that we found that one of the most uh, emotional moments that people have in the game is when they get to a point and they can see all the things that they've created. And you know, we just kind of, sort of give them a little bit of uh, elevation and then have them turn the camera back and suddenly like, you know, the world is revealed and it's surprisingly powerful because it's very personal. And you can look back and you can see the way that you explored the space. And like, oh, there's where I got stuck, you know, where it's like all black and, and everything. And, uh, you know, here's where, where I was, you know, running and there, there are fewer paint splats. Uh, it's interesting from an art, you know, games as art standpoint in that it does make it more personal that, you know, it's something that the player, you know, is, is personally invested in and, and created and, and it has a lot more resonance to them. But it also, as a creator, makes it much harder to curate that experience because, you know, you, you lose a lot of control, so you can, uh, you know, get players more involved, but for certain stories and certain emotions, it definitely runs counter to that, and I think that's something that certainly Journey struggled with, uh, where if, if you let people do whatever they want, that's not necessarily going to fit in with, you know, the emotions that you want them to be feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, you always hit a line where it's like, well, you got to let players be players because it's a game. <laughs> um, we just definitely were more on um, because of the the nature of Flower and Journey, especially, and I think the the form of storytelling we were really comfortable with as a team um, made decisions that were much more of a linear structure to our games for sure. Um, I want to bring in another question from uh, the audience, please. Um, gentlemen on the front row, please, if we can get the mic to you. Again, say uh, who you are, where you're from, and your question, please. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Gregory. I'm from France, uh, from uh, gameblog.fr. Uh, my question revolves around the notion of an author, actually. A, a single person that drives uh, something that's maybe not a painting, maybe not a music, because we're talking about games, but uh, how do you feel about that, that, that specific notion since games are team-made? And does the player have some sort of authorship on the games as art? I think there's, yeah, there's several, several dimensions to that, and it, it ties in with what we're saying to these generated content. I mean, is, is gaming more a, a collaborative art? Um, then, um, and I, I bring in um, Alex on this, um, because he did mention where the players have some sort of share in that art. Yeah, I, I guess so. I love the fact that they're interactive and so, you know, like you're saying, you have this sense that um, a game can reveal your own agency uh, in nice ways. So, like, whereas in film you have directorial, narr direct, you know, it's very direct and there's narrative structure and this stuff, maybe in games we need to explore more, and I'm kind of talking off the cuff here, we can explore explaining to players their own interaction with the game. It's like, hey, look what you did. Isn't that a cool idea? And I hadn't, th I hadn't thought of that before this panel. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I love the idea that at that point, the game, is, the game maker, original game maker, is saying to you, look at your impact on the world. Isn't, isn't this something which is unique to you? And, and you know, we play with that in, in our new game. I, I was spieling at the beginning about it's a unique message, and that's the exact idea, I guess, that, that Rex and his team were coming from. It's like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if at the end of the game, and, and Peter Molyneux and God Games, these guys have all talked about the impact of your play on the game, and that's a, a theme that keeps coming back um, in games. And that, um, Gavin, as, a, as an art director that works with big teams, and is it, I mean, you have a vision for 
you know, how, the, the art of a game, but is it, is it impossible to sort of realise that? It's, it's, it's the, the, the finished article is the product then of a, a collaborative sort of work by many, many sort of hands and, and oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're only going to be as good as the weakest link in the chain, you know, and you try and find the best stuff you can get out there and everybody, I mean, you, you learn this when you speak in different languages and we all, we all speak different languages actually, even though we're all sitting on this panel speaking English, we all have different views and we're all thinking in different ways about what's coming out of our mouths and when you're you're trying to describe some, something to somebody as a game director and an art director and, and you're doing it with words, it's very difficult to actually get across what you really want to do. And as a collaborative force, you suddenly get into that. You can sometimes get into this mess. And it's, you know, I'm a, I'm a big thing on focus testing. I love running focus tests. I love throwing my game to the wolves, basically, and getting in 20, 30, you know, adults and kids and watching them play the game and you sit there scratching your head because you just go, oh my God, they broke my game four million times. Mm -hmm. But they did it in such cool ways. Actually, that's a really good idea, what they tried to do. I need to incorporate that back into the game because they were doing it so much it became interesting. So it's interesting that you brought that up for me. You know, is the player part of the game? Definitely. Absolutely. You can't we exist as creators to, to try and create something for you, but at the same time, if you're not getting enjoyment out of it and you're not having fun with it and you're not getting a personal experience out of it, like you know, the games that these guys are making, then it, it's not worth us being there. Definitely. Part of the game. Totally. Got another question from Twitter here. It is from uh, Magnus Arlberg, and it, it is, it's for Gavin. I'm going to bring this uh, shoe in first on this, actually, which is, uh, what are your thoughts about all the talk around the Japanese gaming industry losing relevance? worldwide oh my god <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, yeah. that's true from the perspective of uh, a uh, American yeah. or maybe European uh, consumers of video games standpoint uh, but from uh, people you know gamers in Japan the most relevant games are you know those made by Japanese people yeah so it's just a different perspective and uh, Cultural differences, Gavin? I think the guys I work with are awesome. They're awesome. They're incredibly astute. They know exactly what's good in the game, what exactly was not good in the game. They have incredible imaginations, and when you let them run, they produce incredible stuff. And I wouldn't be able to produce what you saw today in Puppeteer without that team of, you know, small team of really talented guys. So when people tell me that the Japanese game industry is dead, I think the Japanese, Japanese game industry doesn't just, they just don't want to make it the way that you guys, well, sorry, not you guys, but <laughs> you guys at the back um, have been making it, you know? And uh, the way these games are changing it too. Well, we all don't have 400 staff and we can't have like 100 programmers working on something for four years and turning out some of the stuff that Sony backs, which is absolutely awesome. I mean, you look at the beyonds and stuff and you go, wow, that's incredible. You know. If I had that staff, they could do it. We don't. We're small team orientated. It's better communication for us. We're not very good at managing each other. You know, we're kind of a little bit more crazy over there and that's the way we work. So it's not dead. It's just going in a different way. And when I hear people say this, I kind of have to bite my tongue, which I'm doing now. So. <laughs> I'll stop there, I think. <laughs> Keep it clean, it's a family audience. Yeah. Um, are there any questions from this side of the room? Uh, yes, sir. Just Rob Manuel from uh, G4, United States. I uh, just want to ask a question. And one of the things that you've really been touching on is sort of like the, the personal narrative or the personal voice. How, how can we or how can the game industry sort of like elevate that, bring in new voices as well as elevate the voices, the unique voices that are already out there? Do you mean in terms of just nurturing fresh Nurturing, uh, getting, getting people sort of like, there seems to be, uh, sometimes there's a machine, an industry, as it were, and sometimes you can get lost. Those voices can get lost within that. So how, how can you do that? How can you bring such you know, interesting titles, interesting stories to the masses, the public? Well, I mean, I think the Indie Fund is sort of uh, tied into that and trying to sort of nurture um, young talent. So I'll, I'll bring you in on that, Kelly, first. Um. Yeah, in, invest in people and not in spreadsheets. And I think the games industry still has a big um, legacy issue from software development of, of 
sort of a lot of producers um, having the skill set of managing budgets and spreadsheets where I think that's so interesting about the history of, of Sony game producers coming from music because that, that's in the past often how I've thought about it um, without even knowing that history, uh, which is that you see much more um, in other creative industries the producer's role is really about identifying people um, that you just know. Yeah, it may, be, it may be a crazy process, it may not be a crazy process, but you know that they're gonna come out with like something great at the end of it and like refining our, our gut instincts about that, which my experience with Indie Fund has really been about discovering that. And I think everyone uh, who's a part of Indie Fund, uh, as we had to all, all come from development and now are, are on the other side of the table, um, and evaluating projects and sort of understanding more what publishers and investors go through uh, are seeing that as well. And what we find is in order to maintain what we you know, hope to continue as a very uh, amenable relationship with our developers is that it's about refining our gut um, over time and sometimes taking a leap of faith on, on a new project. I mean, Ian, you've, you've managed to fight your way in and get an opportunity to do your own thing. How, how do we ensure that more people have that opportunity? Uh, I, I think the best way that uh, we can ensure that is to write articles about I developers that are, yeah, like people at G4 or, or <laughs> elsewhere uh, that can, you know, do interviews with, with developers and mention that the games are, are coming out mm -hmm. and, you know, as players to actually buy those games. And then as, as game developers, you know, I think the best thing we can do is to keep making more personal games that are also interesting you know, games that, that people care about. So things like, you know, that, that game company does that as a game designer, it's really inspiring to play a game that feels like a personal work that, you know, it, it helps you to get inspired. That I think a lot of people, you know, just historically haven't really thought about that when they sit down to think about, you know, what is the game that they're going to make, that even indie developers that will be working by themselves will go off and will make a, a tower defense clone or, or whatever, because they just, like, it doesn't occur to them you know, partly that, that they could do that. And, you know, certainly, yeah, having more games that, uh, that, that demonstrate that it's possible. And then also, you know, on the financial side, making that something that is viable, that people can say, like, I'm going to invest, you know, three years of my life making this thing that's personal to me because I think that, you know, there's actually a home for it. I, I, I totally agree. The press is huge. It's over to you guys in this room right now because um, although social media and there's all these other things and viral, you can go viral, but the reality is there are still massive gatekeepers. You know, people with huge power on Twitter and Facebook, Apple feature your iOS game on the front page of their store and boom, you've been discovered. And thinking about me as a gamer, like how do I find stuff that's new and fresh? Actually, there's probably key people I go to and I look at their articles, I look at their blog posts, I look at their, um, their Twitter stream. and. Um, so we were talking about how great Sony was at taking risks on these teams early on and people like Shuhei are like, oh yeah, I'm going to bet on that team. I love the idea of journalists and it's happening more and more, betting on a team too. So you have these, these tastemakers who are like, wow, I really love this game and no one else is talking about it, but I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to make it a success. And that, that power lies with, you know, uh, really is out there. And I think that's really exciting. When, when you meet someone who's passionate about your game as a game maker, when I meet one of you guys and you're like, oh, I love your game. I'm, I'm engaged, I want to talk to you, and it, and it becomes this exciting, virtuous cycle. So over to you guys, really, to find the good stuff. And I think we'll, we'll look forward to the coverage that springs up as a result of this event then. Um, I mean, Adam, you've, you've been very successful in, in areas outside of gaming already, but sort of interactive um, you know, uh, digital experiences. What's your, what's your perspective on the opportunities for, for, for new voices and new ways of making games in gaming specifically? Wow. Uh, I think I'd echo what these guys have already said. There, it came up a little bit in one of the earlier questions. I think large strides are being made um, to the path of least resistance from like idea to output, things like middleware or whatever. But, um, but yeah, I just think that if we, can, if we can keep giving people tools to make things as easily as they can make them and then find ways to get them out to as many people as we can and that's a collaborative thing between the makers and then you guys who help promoting and I mean if we all care about the same sort of things about making great games and uh, telling cool stories or I don't know whatever, whatever what people can champion then um, you know I just feel like it's trending in that direction um, but I don't have like a good answer for like a do A and then you will succeed because that is how I mean there's no way to do I mean there's no like one way to do it um, I don't know I'm just it's exciting so why not 
Gavin, I mean, you work again. You work in very big, big teams where it's mass, massive, huge collaborative efforts. If you're, if I was a young designer wanting to, to and I had great ideas and I wanted to, to, to put them into practice, would I be better off trying to do something myself? Well, I mean, is it possible for me to sort of fulfil my vision by working? Well, in first a big of all, team? I think you should go and badge his shoe. Right, knock on his door and then yeah. like Facebook him until he eventually agrees to, to talk to you. But um, you're going to get a lot of emails now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, but seriously, if you are a young designer out there and you've got a really good idea, and if you are really passionate, don't give up on it, because you will get there. You know, th these are living proof. These people sitting here next to me, they, they did it. Anybody can do it. There are just lots of different ways of doing it. And if you're brave enough, do it on your own. Cloud fund it. Because there's an interesting whole new world out there of getting your own financing now, you know. <laughs> You don't need that big publisher. I shouldn't say that sitting with my boss at the other end of the table. But there are ways of doing things that you can get there if you want to. And if you can fund your game, and then you do need a publisher to get out there to get the marketing out there and the word out there, and you've got a completely working game, you've got a much greater chance than walking in the room with a video. I'll tell you that. And, and some spiel. So there are lots of different ways of getting there. As the big yes. publisher, Shuri, what, what, what's, your, what's your view on this issue? No. It's uh, becoming like a GDC talk now. <laughs> <laughs> but advice from publisher standpoint is, you know, we talk about you know betting on people, you know, creative people, but we always want to see something already created, you know, by those people, you know, like a proof of concept or you know how you can realize the even the part of the vision that you have. So, you know, the advice is, you know, always to make something, you know, prototyping or using yeah. some tools and show it. The really mean, evil part of me is like, please don't show me a game design document. Please show me a game. Even if it's rough, even if you don't know how to make the graphics right and da 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 da. It's like, it's, it's not enough to just kind of spit out an idea onto a piece of paper and then go, please, would you, you make this or back me or Kickstarter me or Sony publish me? You have to show what it is that, that you, is in your head. You have to find friends, you have to find colleagues, you have to go into the Starbucks shop and find that coder who's been sitting there with his MacBook and you just say, hey, could you code this up for me? Do something, because you have to show something running and, and moving and, and, and interactive, because we're making interactive art and no one's going to back you on the basis of a piece of paper unless you're a super genius writer. and uh, that's, that's even rarer than the... Than I don't, know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. In terms of timing, do we have time for one more question or do I have to wrap up? Can anyone give me a, a sign whether we need to? Uh, one more question. Uh, great. Uh, uh, I think uh, the gentleman in the middle of that row over there, please, if you can wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, right now in the industry, I think there's a trend, especially for like the big blockbuster titles, to like uh, create these cinemafied experiences for players, like really linear games with huge budgets, big visuals, like the photorealistic stuff you were talking um, before. What do you guys think about that in terms of art? Because they do succeed in creating an experience for the player, which is interactive to some certain t degree but it's still not like the self-expression thing, which is also very important for art. Adam, you look like you're going to jump in on that. Yeah, I was going to say, did anybody see Avengers? I mean, that's the same thing, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I liked it, but it's not um, the only good movie out there. So I, I always just, because I'm coming from the film side, so I like always sort of draw analogies that direction. It's, there's places for them. It's just that I, I don't know that this, this group is making those sorts of experiences. But I won't, sorry, I won't speak for you guys. <laughs> I mean, we're not making those sort of experiences. That doesn't mean I don't love them. Right. You know? I'm so itching to play The Last of Us, you know, and I, I really want to play that game. There's some really kind of innovative gameplay in there, you know, and the different ways of telling stories in there, depending on what you've done and what you've actually kind of searched for and stuff. So I, I really want to see how they've done that. I mean, you can't, we were talking about this, weren't we, Alex, behind stage, about um, Naughty Dog and how they're on such an amazing role and that company's kind of hitting their stride and going forward in amazing ways. And good, good on them, you know? We, we do it differently from our end, and we're quite happy and fine with that, and we'll make the, the things that we want to make, and they'll make the things that they want to make. I'll definitely play them. <laughs> definitely. I'm I know my son will. Naughty, Naughty Dog is probably the studio which I'm most inspired by personally, although I would never dare 
play in their league. Like they, they, mm. they have these budgets and these people and these pipelines and this experience, which I just don't want to compete with. I'm happy to consume it and play mm. it. But the interesting thing I learned from them is I went to visit those guys early on at Media Molecule, uh, and I've learned so much from them. There's more overlap in terms of how the games are made than you'd expect. There's still the pain and the and the sleepless nights, and it's a different scale in many ways, and they have slightly different uh, emphasis. But I still have so much to learn from those guys, even though I'm never going to make a Last of Us type game. I'm, I'm definitely want to see how they do it and and learn from them. So. Mm. Okay, well, I think we need to uh, wrap up now. So I just want to say to I mean. So final thoughts then really from the panel, I suppose summarising everything we've been talking about over the past hour, what your final thoughts would be to, for people um, you know, watching in, in the audience uh, on the creative potential of video gaming as, a, as an artistic uh, medium, Ian? Oh, that, that sounds pretty easy and specific. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess, uh, Personally, as a player, I guess I'll sort of answer the last question yeah. um, in, in answering that. Like, selfishly, as a player, I just want games to be weirder. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I just feel like I've played this game before so often, and that even when there are new things in games, they're so small. Like, I couldn't point it out to people who are not, you know, players for 20 years. They're like, oh, well, now you can, like, climb around corners. You know, before you could only climb up and down the wall, and, you know, I, I just feel like... There's this whole universe out there that people are not exploring at all, and I'm kind of confused. I don't know if that's because the audience just isn't interested in that, and that may be that the audience just wants to see the Avengers, and that's fine. You can make the Avengers. It's just weird that that's all we have for the most part. That that's it's not all we have, because we have us sitting here. Yeah, yeah, we, we have us, and that's, that's great for us. Uh, and, but and you were players. at E3 this year, right? I was at E3, but I didn't go to It was, it was mainly E3. Avengers. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, as, as we were talking about, that's fine. That's fine. That's, that's the mainstay of our industry. And we have to look at our audience out there as well, you know. We're not all into in wanting to play these new things. A lot of people like the things that they've been playing for a long time. They feel safe with them. And, you know, we have to respect that as creators. And they have to respect that from the other way around. You know, they have to say, you know, we do want innovation. And there are a lot of people in, you know, here today who really do want innovation. They do want it to change. But they also, there's a place for that other stuff as well. Um, Adam, I suppose picking up then from, from what Ian said, what would you like to see more of than I suppose creatively from, from games? Uh, just more focus on interactivity as a medium. <laughs> and, and just like, what if the joysticks didn't control my movement and the camera? You know, that, whoa. <laughs> um, I think we're at a really exciting time, and my closing, I had a prepared statement in my head. After Go I ahead. Question. Shoot. I think the most consistent path to success is to make your own, and um, that's the best advice I can give, uh, that no one's going to hand you, like, here, this is, you, you know, congratulations, you win. You've got to sort of start it yourself and do it yourself, and even if that's within a larger company or totally on your own in your basement, um, with a couple of friends, um, I just think that like you got to get started, and it's got to come from inside of you to make to make something really personal and worth playing. Alex, I'd love to see more development in the open and engage engaging with our audience because I think gamers uh, have a diet of more than one type of game. They enjoy you know the weird stuff, but I think they also can enjoy other kinds of games at the same time. And I'm really inspired by you know the process of development where people like Notch are developing and there are nightly builds and he's engaging with his audience as a part of the design process. So for me, my future, I really look forward to game developers engaging with their audience directly because it will lead to weirder stuff. I never underestimate the gamers. They, they aren't just wanting bread and butter every day. They, they want that, but they also want some some freaky stuff on the side and, <laughs> and, and let's find out what that is and, and, and how they want it because, because we learned with UGC never ever underestimate the gamers oh my god they, they can do incredible stuff um, so yeah that's what I want to see more of and we'll leave the, the final word to you Shue. well I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, small games digitally distributed games I want people to pay more attention to games on like a PSN stores you know games you know that are uh, uh, have really creative um, uh, ideas, new uh, interactivity games like Unfinished Swan, you know, Journey, you know, Sound Shapes, or Tokyo Jungle. You know, there are lots of uh, you know hidden gems. You know, Tokyo, if you uh, Tokyo uh, Jungle, by the way, blew my mind when I saw it at E3. Like, I, I cannot believe. Like, I, I saw a screen that said. Uh, 
Pomeranian level three. But he's like the idea that you were a Pomeranian like running around. Well, they're here at Gamescom. So the TV yeah. It, so. yeah, I've been the Pomeranian level three. I tell yeah. you, it's awesome. <laughs> So did you okay. finish or was there any more? Yeah. That was that's, it. That's it. Great. Well, uh, thank you for those who've come and for your questions. For those of you uh, watching online, I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for your questions too. But ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for the panel. Thanks, guys.